I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be empowered. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. I think over the summer, we had a big fight. Um, and I had never fought her before. It was the first time where I actually spoke openly about how I felt. Um, and she was insisting on me doing something for her. And I, I got angry because I thought she didn't deserve what it was that she was asking for. I met him in church. Nice looking brother was outside in his Senegalese kaftan having this chat with this girl. So I looked at him and I thought, ah, nice guy. You know, and I liked his outfit, what he was wearing. I thought, okay, I must make this for my boyfriend. So I said to him that, I asked him what he got him made. He told me, he said, ah, he can actually take me to the tailor. So perfect. So I decided to tell my friend, I met this guy. You're going to drive us to the tailor's place so I can introduce you to the guy. So we got in the car. I sat at the back. And I sat in front with my friend. And we got to the tailor's place in Ovalende. We got back to dropping him off, found ways for them to exchange numbers. Because obviously I was consciously trying to match make them. One day I go and visit her. She's on the phone with her now, right? So I take the phone from her and say, hmm. So since you started talking to her now, you don't even think about calling me, me that I was the one that brought you guys together. So he said, ah, don't worry, I'll call you, blah, blah, blah. So he picks up the phone and calls me. Um, and... He spoke for like one hour. The day he calls me. Fella now walks into the house one day to visit. And he just stopped Alice. And my mom is like from the Yoruba speaking side of Edo, Edo State. She falls absolutely in love with me. She's like, where did you get this guy from? I'm like, ah, he's not my friend though. I'm trying to match make him with Ozie. My mom said, what? <laughs> Can you imagine this silly girl? So I say to her that no, 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 no. That's I'm not uh, I'm not interested in that, you know. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try and see if I can. So I got engaged him talking about my friend. Could tell there was, there wasn't any chemistry, or whatever. So Fernanda and I developed our relationship as just friends. First, I didn't. There wasn't any one moment, but I think that as the relationship progressed, I knew. So I didn't have that unrest that I had before in that other relationship. I had a sense of peace in this relationship. I didn't even think there was a need to go through this ritual of checking because I just knew that I knew. But what was interesting was one day we were at a prayer meeting and the pastor asked, this is a season of fasting, right? And one of the things you can benefit from doing this fast is if you think that you're in a relationship that you're not supposed to be in, this would be a time to know. So is there anyone here who feels like the innovation they're not supposed to be in? And guess who puts up his hand? Fella. I was angry. I couldn't believe it because I didn't even know that he felt that way. Because obviously we had been dating for a bit for a while, maybe a few months or whatever. And uh, I didn't know whether to go and wait for him in the car or just to find my way. Get on the bus, take a taxi. I was just confused and we we're fasting. So it meant that we we're also going home to my house to break the fast and, and all of that and just to have a chat with my mom because my mom would be in the house. And he just said, okay, that, um, well, he needs some time to pray about it. I'm like, what? This guy was a duty. I need some time to pray about it. I got home again. This time I cried. Stayed up all night crying and crying and crying. Then maybe two days after he was going to South Africa for work. So he said when he comes back, he will decide what he's going to do. My biological mom, who I was now going to see, I'm going to stay in her house, said to me that she had a dream. In the dream, she saw that I married a guy. And she said, the guy is Yoruba. 
and it had quite a pointed nose, is what she saw in her dream. And it's a bit light skinned. His mom is, or his parents are, something in the academic world. I almost passed out because, of course, I didn't tell her about any relationship. But this guy has now said to me that he's going to pray about it and decide when he comes back. I was shocked, but it was precise. My husband's mom was a professor and so was his dad. So I knew that it was him. So I sat down, she said, what's the matter? I said, I'm actually dating the guy, this guy I was talking about. I said, really, yes, yes. And I said, but he just broke up with me, uh, just like last week. She said, oh, don't worry, he's coming back. I just wish she said it made me feel like she was, she was perfectly right. So I did my normal shopping for my boyfriends that I always do, right? <laughs> so I bought all the things, the suits, this and that. I mean, returned back to Lagos. And when he returned back from South Africa, he said to me, he called me on the phone while he was still there and said, God spoke to him clearly that I was his wife. And here we are, 15 years after. I didn't do a big wedding. So I had about 30 people at my wedding. I had a dress made by Tiffany Amber, simple dress. We went to the registry. Came back, had uh, a pastor friend of ours bless our marriage. Spent money on our rings, and that was it. Didn't have a big wedding. My pastor said I was going to regret it. I don't. Because I, I think that I was so consumed by my marriage working that I didn't want to be distracted by anything, including a wedding. I wanted to focus more on knowing him, exploring him, finding out what he liked, what he didn't like, be conscious of his weaknesses so I know what I'm getting into. So we spent time with count in counseling. We bought books to read that I had to read, that he had to read, and we needed to share and review and think about this. Because we're both, we had, we're both broken. It was too important for us that we didn't, we wanted this to work. And not just work for the work, sake of working, not just for our children, but also for us. Then I wanted me to be happy. I also wanted him to be happy. And I made it my responsibility to make sure that he's happy so that I don't have to try to make myself happy. All I have to do is just be certain that as I'm doing for him, he'll respond accordingly. So I don't have to try, try and think about to cover my own back because I know he's covering my back. He also doesn't need to cover his back because I'm covering his back. This was the things that I was more concerned about. So I didn't have a big wedding and I was, I'm still very happy. 15 years after, I'm still very happy that I didn't have a big wedding. I don't regret it. I don't regret it. I don't regret it. Here I was, um, a young mom, and I got pregnant very early. Um, so I had my first child, came back. Nobody told me that after having your first child, you may have postnatal post, uh, depression. No one told me that. So I arrived in Ireland and was miserable, right? Um, took my baby to the airport without a passport because I just wanted to come back home. Got to the airport and they said to me, you can't travel. And I'm like, you're kidding. This child belongs to me. They're like, no, you have to have an evidence that this child is yours. And I start wailing at the at his house, screaming and crying that I want to go back home. I want to go back to Nigeria now. My mom is with me. She's been with me for a few weeks. And she's thinking, I have done everything to make you comfortable. What can I, what else can I do? And I'm standing at the airport and I'm saying, they need to get this child on this passport because I have to go. Nobody told me that when you get back after you're having your first child, you may not want to have sex anymore. No one told me that. No one told me that it would become difficult. That if you had a cut during your childbirth, that you want anything in there anymore. No one told me that. So I got there shocked. Like, this is the sex that I've been looking forward to having since. I've only had it for a few, just maybe about a year. And then all of a sudden, I don't feel like having this anymore. How did that happen to me? These are some of the things that I just didn't learn. And my mom couldn't teach me and I had to learn it in the Ileoko, as they say. Ileoko ni Ileoko. I didn't know that. No one told me. I got there and, and realized that you, know, you can be depressed. You can have a baby, be excited, but at the same time sad. I, I remember seeing somebody at, in the hospital in Nigeria that I didn't know. Just because I heard somebody calling the guy's name. I thought I was Nigerian. <laughs> I just found him. And I started crying. I hugged the guy and he thought, he didn't know why I was hugging him, but he saw the way I was crying. So he too decided that he was going to hug me back. 
I arrived at the airport the next day. You know, the first day they sent me back and said, ma'am, you can't travel because you don't have any evidence that this is your child. So I went back the next day. My mom had taken my passport to the Nigerian High Commission to try and help me sort, put him on my passport. By four o'clock, I was already at the airport the next day. I was actually on the queue when they brought the passport. I, it was like, I was going, I must leave today. Whatever they do, they must get me that passport. My mom is, you know, like I, like I said, they're resilient. I got back to Nigeria and promised myself I'll never have a baby outside Nigeria again because when I had my second child, just the excitement in the air, the number of visits to the hospital, just before you can even be depressed, somebody else has come. Just before you can carry the baby, one auntie is there to carry the baby. Just before you can even say, let me carry it, somebody else has come to carry the baby. And all of that experience, I committed that after this one, I'm going to have all my children in Nigeria. And there's no, there was no comparison. I wanted to be a great mom. I wanted to be in every school activity. And I was. I take my children to school, pick them up in the afternoon. I'm very particular about sensing my children, feeling them. I think there's something happening. I think there's something going on. I go to their room. I pray, 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 pray. And then in the morning, we go to their dad that I didn't let them sleep. <laughs> because of all the prayers. My second son says that his dad is his best friend, so you can imagine, right? It means that he's very involved. He plays with them a lot. Um, football, swimming. Um, his father died when he was 11. So I think that he also wants to give. He feels like he needs to, every moment is important for the children. That's why my son can say that. Because he, he knows his father is engaged. Hence, if his father doesn't come for visit, one visiting day, he can have the answer to tell me it's like five out of 10. <laughs> So he's a, he's a good dad and I'm, I'm very, very, very um, happy that he gets the opportunity to be able to raise his sons at a young age. I get where my children, because they see me more, so if they get into trouble and you say, I'm going to tell your mom, they're sad, but if you tell them, I'm going to tell your dad, they're frightened. Like, they want to impress their dad. They're more interested in impressing him than impressing me. I think they think I'm just like someone next door, right? Um, so I get that feeling that I don't like. But I try to manipulate them now and again. Uh, if I see that they don't hug me enough, I demonstrate. I do all these. I feel like, I feel let down. I feel, I do all those things. I think, ah, this is what the same mother in laws do to their sons. <laughs> I'm already practicing. Um, I do have that feeling. And I think because I'm, a, I'm more available. But I feel sorry for my husband. I think to myself, oh, your children think that you are perfect. Then the day you do something bad, they're going to be so shattered. But at least they don't think I'm perfect, so I'm free, right? You know, um, they, I, we, we have those days, and I, I think we've had them. I mean, see, they're saying his dad is his best friend. Why didn't say my mom is my best friend? And I'm here with you. <laughs> we didn't decide strategically to expand. We had a landlady who was increasing our rent year in, year out. And at some point, she was now going to increase it so significantly that we felt we couldn't afford it. So I decided to do a survey where I asked customers where they would like our location to be. We found out that for the survey, that 50% or 40 something percent said they wanted us to be remain in VI. Another 40 something percent said they wanted us to be in Ikeja. It became clear to us that we needed to have a second branch in Ikeja. That's how we decided to have our, our, our first expansion plan. So we went to our bankers at the time. Uh, this was Oceanic Bank. And they said, oh, definitely they'll give us the money. And then subsequently they came and said, oh, sorry, we can't give you the money. At this point, we had already deposited maybe 150,000 uh, Naira towards this 1.5 million Naira rent. And the agency had said, if you deposit this money and you don't pay the balance, you lose, you forfeit the amount. 500000 for us at the time was a lot of money. What was then interesting was the bank says they were not giving us this money. We needed to find a way to pay. I remember going to um, see Mrs. Ibuka Wushika. Uh, I was invited to an event where she was being honored. So I walked up to her and I told her, this is the situation that I find myself in. Uh, we have now gone to our other bank uh, to ask to get funding 
and the bank had outrightly refused that they wouldn't be able to give us. And this time we were just asking for 500,000 naira um, overdraft. And I told her this and she said to me she'll call the MD of the bank on our behalf. Um, she did call the MD of the bank and he called me. At the time we were generating a few million naira in a year. But it was amazing that he could pick up the phone to call me. And when he called me, he said, oh, I hear you're unhappy with us. I would like you to come in for a meeting. So I called Mr. Dawashik back and I said, this is my current situation. She said, yes, I knew you were going to call you. I told him that you started your business from nothing and you've grown it to this level. And I think it's a story that they should think about. He called me and she, she called me and she coached me and said, well, you're going to have a meeting with him. This is what you should talk about. Talk about where you're coming from, talk about where you are now, and share with him where you're going. That's very important. And she said to me, you have an accountant with you? I said, yes. Take him with you. When you get, to, when you get there, he's going to ask you about your numbers, your gross profit margin, your net profit margins, all this information. Let the accountant give that information because he's going to ask. Can you just share your story and be very comfortable and confident? So I, I went to see the MD of the bank. And he said to me, Tell me, tell me about yourself, tell me about your business. And I told him about how I started with 15,000 Naira. He thought I was interesting. I explained to him the business itself, the service part of it, the product part of it. He thought interesting. After looking at the accounts, to see the discipline in, you know, to see a business that was banking their money. And he could see the consistency in the banking and so, and the, in the deposits. And so he wondered, he said, your accounts officer should have been able to give him tell a good story so that you can get this loan. But as he listened to the story, he was moved by it. And how did I know he was moved by it? Because he said to me, I should pause. And he went and called for the head of retail to come into the meeting. And he said, I want you to listen to this lady's story. So I started to tell the story again. And when I finished, he said to me, this is the kind of story that our bank would like to be part of. But then he asked, so how much money are you looking for? And you can't guess how much I asked for. Take a guess. Take a wild guess. <laughs> I asked for 40 million. <laughs> he was shocked. He said, but you, you, um, um, you wanted 500,000. I said, yes, I wanted 500,000 because I wanted 500,000 for to rent so and so, but my business needs more than that. And I explained to him how I had created this product line and how my product line was only six products in the entire line. And this, what you're seeing is from just six products. You can imagine what we could do if we expand it to 10, 20 products and how the business would expand. So he said, okay, can we negotiate? Um, I said, well, you should tell me. So he said, what about 10 million? I said, no, I said, I said 20 million. And he said, okay, let's start with 15 million. So I agreed. Uh, but then he asked me, so how are you going to collateralize the loan? So I said to him that the products that I have, um, the stock that I had, because I put my money where my mouth is, I have stock that can be as a collateral. He said, no, you can't use my products as collateral. I need to be able to get maybe a landed property. Then he said to me, can you ask your husband to give you something to use as a collateral. So I said to him, sir, with all due respect, would you ask my husband, if my husband came for a loan, would you ask my husband to give, give you something to collateralize his loan? Ah, he thought that was below the belt. So he said, oh, I'm sorry. I said that I didn't mean to sound like that. You know, um, okay, let's pretend like I didn't say that, okay? So I said, I promise that I'm going to pay back this loan. I said, I have a name to protect. I did walk away from that from getting an approval for 15 million naira from 500,000. The entire business model has been about empowering people, whether empowering internal uh, employees or empowering our beauty representatives, those who sell our products. There are now over 5,000 of them across the country. And with these 5,000 ladies, I believe that our work is not to just to empower them to become financially independent, but also become female leaders. And leadership is about your ability to influence and attract following and to develop them to have a voice 
so that whatever community that they find themselves, they can give back also. So for us, it's great that we are empowering those ladies to become financially independent. But we spend we spend a lot of time at conferences every year across the nation and teaching all kinds of values, all kinds of skill set. To let the ladies know that we are not in this business just to make money. We are here to ensure that we have women who can rise up tomorrow and become true leaders because of the values that they stand for, because of who that they are. And yet they are financially independent, but also they are leading and leading right. I think about the TFD ser series, for example, uh, part of our mandate is that every time you come to listen and you learn from the older women, you need to go and pay it forward. You need to go out there, get a group of them, at a minimum of five ladies who you can share your learnings with so that the message goes further and more lives are being impacted because we're such a huge country and there's so much that we can do if only people will raise their voice. I think it's important for women to have mentors. Um, and one of the reasons why it's for all kinds of... So one of them is accountability. Um, accountability. Accountability even across board. So my mentor knows that if something happens and I feel she's going out astray, I have been given permission to correct, to say, this is what I'm thinking. But a mentor can almost see, because of their own experience, can almost see beforehand when you're going to make that mistake. It's just based on experience. When you see the grey hair on their hair, it's not just there for decoration or for being grey. It's cool. It's because they have some scars and they have some stripes that come from being generals. And the general because they've been to some wars and they haven't been to. We all need sounding boards. But sometimes when, we, when our sounding boards are our pairs, they see things on the same level that we see things. Um, and a, a mentor has an, an ego eye view of the issues. So sometimes they can for also, yet again, be able to advise you from being someone who's been on, who's standing over your shoulder. And so they see things from a different perspective. So from a sounding board's perspective, mentors are also good. Many times you need someone who will stand up and, and, and put a word down for you in a place where you are not in. Or you don't even have access to because you're just not at that stage in your in your journey but they, they are mentors are also people who are cheerleaders so your mentor will when they hear about your success or they know you shared the idea with them and then you have now created and, and allowed it to happen they sound as cheerleaders so and mentors are the people who will celebrate uh, me as well and, and, and my journey so i also feel the responsibility to do the same they would also help you to find some things that you didn't know existed. My mentor said to me, you define yourself too much by House of Tara. You define your success and your failures by House of Tara. And you are beyond House of Tara. You are bigger than House of Tara. And when she said it to me, I actually was offended because I am House of Tara and House of Tara is all that I am, was my thoughts, was what I had come to see. And that's all I've experienced. Is was forced to see otherwise and if I didn't have that mentor to tell me that I probably would not have heard it from any I, I don't even know if anyone would have been able to tell me that but after one year nine months of being away from the business I realized that there's so much more there's so much more that is inside of me that I could explore I could do but I didn't see because House of Child was so big in my eyes but somebody looked at it and saw differently so mentors are immense contribution that you can give Give it, get them, bring it to your life. Just make sure that you have the right one. I wonder how people who don't have faith can actually survive the world because the world is such a cruel place to be. But then, because of my exposure to my faith, to the tenets of my faith, to the disciplines of my faith, I think I'm surviving life much better. And I think I survived my childhood much better because of my faith. I think that I'm able to forgive much easier because of my faith. I think to make a decision for who to marry, my faith has given me guidelines. Uh, the decision for which school my children to, should go, go to, my faith has given me that. To how to run my business, my faith has given me guidelines. And I see it over and over again. So we're going through a time in Nigeria where the economy is very bad. And people are depressed. They are de de depressed because... The, and I look at Elijah and someone who lived in a time where there was famine. And in spite of the famine, God could raise provision for him through a raven. 
and through a window. And that's how God works. He operates in strange ways. This is my experience of him. This is my experience of my faith. It's my ability to be able to take biblical principles and apply it to my everyday life. If I was to die today and look back at my life, I think that I wish I had enjoyed this last 18 years while building my business. So I'm very focused on my focus. And sometimes in the bid to focus on my focus, I don't enjoy the journey on my way to my focus. Um, I've only just learned that to be become to become more aware. To become more, to become more present, to self-care, meaning think about myself in my giving, also care about myself in the in, in, in the process. Um, to become also to be able to stand to stare, to not always analyze something to mean anything, just to be able to look at things and not think anything. Just enjoy the green tree and actually hear the sound of the waters. And when it rains, not to complain that it's raining and it's it's affecting sales, but to actually enjoy the sound of the rain as it hits the roof or when it hits the ground, um, to allow myself to walk through the rain and not be worried about it spraying my shoes, but to allow it to bit, hit my head, and not be afraid that my river will smell. It's fine, the smell to wash it tomorrow, but I enjoy the journey on my way to my focus, is what I would advise my 16 year old.